And we're live. And we're live. Yeah. Uh, I'm fucking I'm s- sick of tech issues when doing remote shows. I'm, I'm going to try and get as close to 100% live shows next year. I can't fucking do this. It does my head in. Yeah. I mean, in person is always better. I was uh, bummed that we couldn't make it work this year. Well, listen, I'm not going to dox you, but I'm going to be near you somewhere soon-ish at some point in the future, between now and the end of life, somewhere in the world. Fuck yeah. Well, let me know, and uh, we have a spare bedroom at our house if you need a spot to crash. Well, that would be very kind of you. How you doing anyway, man? I think, is this the fourth year in a row we've done this? I was thinking back. The first one was 2019. What's so this is the third one. We didn't do it in 2018. I think I th- I think it was New Year's 2019 was the first year in review, and we did it with Neil Woodfine. No, that wasn't an end of year one, was it? Yeah, it was, wasn't it? Was it? I can't remember. It was like did a January look- episode, 2019. Did you look um, it up? Let me look it up. I'm going to go to the Matto Dell page on what Bitcoin did. Yeah, I think so, because I had just started Rabbit Hole Recap. We've done a bunch of other episodes, but in terms of the end of the year, we did our first one in 2019 with Neil Woodfine, and I was it was because I was specifically thinking about how much has changed over the last three years, uh, both with Bitcoin in the world, but also just with us. Um, and I remember Neil kind of gave me like a little bit of a lecture. He's like, you started a podcast, you know, like what else have you done for Bitcoin? And uh, since then I've (laughs) fucking just like made it a mission to do as many things in in the Bitcoin world as possible and try and further this mission. Uh, So you're crazy three years. We're kind of both right. We did that. That was January the 8th, 2019. Boom. And that was a predictions for the year with you and uh, Neil. Then we did a 2019 review at the end of that year, and then we did a 2020 review. Yeah, no, you're right. It's three. It's this three. is our third end of year one. Third annual review. Uh, I think I'm getting confused because we did another one in uh, New York one time, didn't we? That was. That was with Marty. No, but we also did an in person at my old place in New York. Yeah, we did. Well, you were that was that was the 2020 that was the 2020 uh year in review or 2019 did. year in review that was like at the yeah. cusp of 2019 2020 right before all the covid craziness happened and then last year was the one where we got really drunk <laughs> we got trashed in the middle of uh, <laughs> all the lockdowns yeah i didn't even remember the last 20 minutes of that one yeah i'm gonna try and stay a little bit sober uh, I forgot. I forgot to send you a drink as well. But it's a high bar. I have, uh, I have really, really good Kentucky whiskey. Well, I owe you uh, a bottle. I, I said I'd send you one. I didn't because I'm useless. I've got, I actually, I, got some... I haven't finished the bottle you sent me last year. I've just been sipping on it for special occasions. That's a good bottle. Uh, but it well, didn't I'm... make it on the move. I don't know where it is. I mean, I think it did, but I, I have boxes all over the place right now. We got two Peter shifts as well now. I know you're, did, you're stacking I, shifts. Stacking shifts. I did an interview with uh, Callum Roche in New York, and he brought one. He brought me another shift. So it's I'm going to be challenging people. It's every your time thing I do now. Interview. Now people are just going to bring you shift portraits. I'm going to, I'm going to have a, like a room of shifts. Just I'm going to have to take a suitcase of shifts with me all around the world. But but yeah, no, I did this sprint uh, recently in. Miami, DC, and New York. We did 18 shows in two weeks, and that's like six weeks of shows. And then I'm going to go out to some place. I'm not going to say because I don't want to dox myself where I'll be, Matt, because that would be irresponsible as a Bitcoiner. But I'm going to be uh, a couple of locations for two weeks. Can do. I think I'm going to do it the same. Every six to eight weeks, I'm going to go out and do two weeks of shows, get them all in person. I like that's that way, strategy. Man. That's a good strategy. That is the way. Anyway, man, I love you, man. Big year. Cheers. Cheers. To even Did bigger you f- year this year. Next year. Well, this year for when it's... Oh, no, when's this coming out? No, this is coming out on Friday. You're dropping this on Friday? Yeah, Friday 31st. New Year's Eve. 
New Year's Eve is coming out, man. Let's fucking go. Happy New Year's yeah. Eve, everyone. Happy New Year's, everyone, if you listen to this and uh, you're not out there drinking. Do you know what the weird thing is? I checked the download stats for Christmas Day. It's like 12,000 downloads or something on Christmas Day. I was like, fucking nerds are listening to a Bitcoin podcast. No, Christmas you know what Day. it is, right? What's up? The same thing happens on Thanksgiving. It's people are driving to family. Mm. What, on Christmas Day? I guess, yeah. Like some people, I mean, some people will just come for Christmas dinner, right? And they're driving in the morning. They won't actually stay with family. They'll go whatever family's house they're doing Christmas at. Um, and that's why. Still. They shouldn't be Alternatively, big- maybe they just, you know... <laughs> That they just decided to have a Bitcoin Christmas and didn't have family around or something like that. Man, they should have a break. They should be listening to Or Wham. maybe, maybe you have such dedicated listeners that uh, they go over to their family and they take their phone and they press subscribe and auto download. <laughs> it's just uh, downloads but not listens. Dude, I had dedicated listeners, man. Four of them turned up in my football match today. Uh, what, Liverpool? No, Bedford. Are you guys actually already playing? Yeah, we yeah we played a game today. We drew one. Do you own the team yet? I own the team. It's pretty cool what you're doing, man. I do. Yeah. Uh, I'm rooting for you. We can talk about that in a bit, man. But let's talk about your year. Um, What's been the uh, highlight? Have you got a highlight from the year? I've been doing so many different things. Uh, uh, one highlight is I got out of New York, uh, which I had already done, but I was just a nomad. Uh, but now, actually, I have like a proper roof over my head, um, so that feels good. I, you know, actually getting my brain sorted on a personal note. Um, but uh, this year, I mean, we launched OpenSats for open source development. Um, Citadel Dispatch started after our show last year; it hadn't started yet. Um, it's about a year, we, though, right? It's been a year, forty-eight episodes. Skipped a couple weeks there, just took a holiday break for that. Uh, Rabbit Hole Recap is over three years, haven't skipped a week yet. Um, finally brought on a producer. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're working on a, uh, a venture fund that's Bitcoin only, 1031, that I'm really excited about. Uh, doing it the right way rather than all these A16Zs and polychain and whatnot. Yeah. Um, working my, my work with Bitcoin Magazine is... Uh, been absolutely uh crazy journey over there i mean we have the we have we're currently you know i joined them in october of last year and it was like seven employees uh and now we're we're past 60 i believe uh we threw a massive show for bitcoin 2021 and now bitcoin 2022 is going to be absolutely fucking insane dude um bitcointv.com launched take it on youtube they can go fuck themselves um it's been it's been a it's been a whirlwind of a year personally how how are you keeping on top of it all that's a lot of stuff yeah i'm doing my best (laughs) have you got yourself an assistant yet no assistant i do not have an assistant those uh sats go straight into my pocket dude you should get yourself an assistant i know i'm actually considering it um, it, will, it will make you infinitely more productive. Yeah, I should probably do that. It's, uh, I mean, just email addresses alone. I'm at like eight or nine email addresses yeah. I have to check on a daily basis. It's uh, getting pretty exhausting, but uh, it's good. It's good productivity. It's, you know, uh, I completely left my fiat job. Uh, you know, I had yes. to... Uh, make the transition fully into Bitcoin, which is something that I've preached against for a long time. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's something that I truly enjoy and it's a mission I want to support. And uh, I was fucking done with New York, so it had to be <laughs> fucking done. Man, New York's weird now. I've been a couple of times. Uh, I had one weird trip, but, but I had <clears throat> I did have one good trip. Uh, but I had one weird trip where I was like, what the fuck has happened to this place? Like everything was weird. Uh, you were seeing people in a, like in a really fucked mess in, you know, just like around places like Times Square, just like off their face, laying on the floor, pissing themselves. And, and open oh, you dr- mean like homeless people? Yeah, like um, open drug dealing in Times Square. It's like literally, do you want to buy weed and coke? Like not 
that I have an issue with people selling drugs, and I'd be a hypocrite. But well, I would say the drug weird. the drug sellers are like the least of it. Like the the homeless situation has gotten completely out of control over there. Yeah, uh, they basically the mayor's office basically told the police not to enforce anything. Same with graffiti. Um, and like minor offenses, and it's just been a massive slippery slope. I mean, we haven't, I don't really care about politics. I think it's uh, kind of a waste of time, but we do have a new mayor coming in in January, so can't Eric, be much Eric worse. Adams? Yeah, I think that's his name. Uh, it can't be much worse. You know, he likes he likes to say the word Bitcoin, so the Bitcoiners all rally, but he's, yeah. he's you know, going to do the shitcoin thing as well. But... Uh, it's a low bar to be better than our previous mayor or existing mayor right now. Well, he's a centre-left guy. I think he'll be. I think he will undo some of the bullshit. That That's what I'm saying. It's a low bar, the, right? But yeah. the problem is, like, once you get started down this path, um, you know, it's going to take a while. And I definitely was not down to uh, to you know, life is short. I'm not going to to wait that out. Life is short, man. I, I have I have no doubt in my mind that New York will rise again. Uh, it's just a question of how long it's going to take, and yeah. uh, it could be it could be quite a while. In the meantime, um, I'm in a place where I have a lot of good friends. Uh, restaurants are open, crime is low, uh, no income tax, and uh, really strong Bitcoin community. And I'm looking for land. I want. I want to uh, want to build my citadel somewhere. You're gonna build your citadel. You're gonna do your citadel dispatch from the fucking citadel. From, that was the whole point of citadel dispatch from my citadel to your citadel. Boom. Well, listen. Let's go. Let's talk about citadel dispatch, right? You've done 48 episodes. You've done a year. What have you found doing it? Have you enjoyed it? I. It's a passion project for me. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, one thing I've experimented with Citadel Dispatch is I fucking hate the advertisement model, the sponsorship model. Um, it fucking works, dude. Yeah, well, Dispatch is completely audience funded, uh, partially through Podcasting 2.0, and then also through one-off donations of Lightning or um, on-chain payments, all Bitcoin. It's just completely audience funded through Bitcoin. And... It's definitely a way harder monetization path uh, than ad model. Um, but in a lot of ways, it's extremely rewarding. And we've had really great conversations. The goal of the show is, is free form. Uh, we have a live audience that participates with chat so they can really participate as, as, as the show's going on. Uh, the shows are very open ended. Some, you know, a lot of them went three hours. So even though it's forty eight episodes, uh, probably over one hundred and fifty hours of free Bitcoin content, all focused on Bitcoin. We get into the nitty gritty, go really deep, technical, but also I have a great beginners episode that I did with Bitcoin Q and A recently. That's just two hours of straight from you know zero to one, getting started with Bitcoin in what I think is the right way and what Bitcoin Q and A thinks is the right way. Um, and I'm just, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working through the kinks there. I, I don't want to ever really put ads on that show. Um, I kind of, I'm kind of treating it as an open source project um, because that's what it's focused on. It's, it's focused on Bitcoin, but also the wider free open source uh, movement. Um, and those developers, you know, don't have easy paths to monetization either. And part of my focus with OpenSats is to help give grants and funding to those types of developers. And I feel like, um, you know, it's 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 important to me that I, I at least with one of my projects, I go down a similar path as 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 these dedicated contributors. Because what they do, if we didn't have if we didn't have these open pro open source projects and contributors, like Bitcoin would not be anywhere close to where it's at today. I mean, Bitcoin Core alone is obviously a free open source project, but stuff like BTC Pay, Seed Signer, uh, Raspi Blitz, Ronin Dojo, like they L and D, C Lightning. If, if we didn't have these projects and contributors, Bitcoin wouldn't be a success. Uh, Bitcoin wouldn't be as robust as it is today. And it's important that we start to try and really figure out different ways to make to make those kind of projects sustainable. Uh, so that they can grow and get more robust over time, right? Can you talk about any of the numbers behind running as like audience funded so people can get an idea of like the grind or? <laughs> uh, 
we have the ad model on Rabbit Hole Recap weekly show. Yeah. We have, uh, and then I have Citadel Dispatch, which is also a weekly show without the ad model. Mm -hmm. uh, Rabbit Hole Recap gets slightly more listeners than Citadel Dispatch, but they're very close uh, in listener numbers. And my total yearly return uh, on terms of audience funding is a little bit more than my cut of one episode of Rabbit Hole Recap. One episode. Yeah. So it's about it's about a fifty. And we just recently passed that. Like Citadel, I, Dispatch just recently passed one episode of Rabbit Hole Recap. So it's a fiftieth. Yeah. Yeah. See, but I think I think part of it, right? Part of it is we need to develop. Like the ad model is tried and true. It's an obvious path, right? It's been mm. ironed out by people before us. You you know how to monetize with ads. Um, this idea of having people contribute uh, value directly to the creator uh, to support the project is 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 something that hasn't been ironed out, right? So there's different, um, like first of all, podcasting 2.0, like the apps are starting to finally get there. Stuff like like Fountain Podcasts, very easy to use interface. It feels like a mainstream podcasting app. You can make it very easy to support your show. And and what I've noticed is like a lot of people want to support. They believe in the mission. The question is reducing the friction, right? To make it as easy as possible for them to do that. Um, and there's a lot of things that still need experimentation that I haven't really done. Uh, and that's on me. I'm pretty busy. Uh, and I have every intention of continuing dispatch, even if I don't get that financial support for it. Um, but things like QR codes embedded in the screen, right? Uh, and, and a lot of these things are what we're working on at BitcoinTV.com to make it easy for creators to just kind of plug in, right? So that they don't have to think from the ground up, I need uh, to, to figure out how to make this audience supported model work. Now, one thing that is interesting is John Carvalho's show has like that crowd paywall thing, mm. um, which is an interesting concept where the show doesn't unlock until a certain amount of sats have been donated. I personally don't like paywalls, so I just won't do that. But that is another model that could potentially work. I mean, the show literally does not launch unless you unless the crowd pays for it. Um, but, you know, these are all things that need to get worked out and they won't get worked out. It's a chicken and egg thing. They won't get worked out unless someone actually tries to make it work. But ultimately, the way I look at it is uh, right now, you know, if 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 we can get to a point where the majority of Bitcoin content the majority of content in general that people consume is supported directly by the audience with Bitcoin, then you have a direct uh, incentive, basically. You have a direct incentive to do best by your audience, and they're the ones funding you. And you don't have, you know, every time I talk about a topic, we talk about every topic on Rabbit Hole Recap, on Dispatch, no topics off limits. But every time a sponsor comes up, it automatically, um, puts you on this weird footing. Oh, disclosure, disclosure, disclosure. Or oh, they're not saying enough. Oh, is this sponsor doing this? Is this sponsor doing that? Um, so I, I would much prefer to be in a situation where we don't have to rely on big companies uh, in the space to basically fund our work uh, and that we can just be completely funded by the audience. Uh, and that's a goal that I continue to strive for, both with Dispatch and with BitcoinTV.com. Well, commendable, man. I commend you for it. Uh, I've tried, you know, with my show, you can uh, subscribe as a Patreon and get the show without ads. I think it's like five bucks a month minimum. Or I used to do a thing where you could like, you could pay me $60 on Lightning Network and that would get you it for the year without ads. And I think it's like 15 people have done that, of which... This show will, my show will do, I think we're tracking it somewhere like 11.1 .1 million downloads for the year. Like 12 people. Could not yeah, make I mean, it look, work, man. Right now, right now, it's, it, it could be worse. I mean, look, at the end of the day, like the, 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 the not closely guarded secret is that people can skip the ads if they don't want to listen to the ads, yeah. right? The scary thing for me is like what happened with Joe Rogan, right? Where he signs an exclusivity deal with Spotify. He leaves an open system. He goes to a proprietary system because they're going to pay him more. Deletes 25 uh, you can only episodes. listen to it. What? Deletes 25 episodes. 
deletes 25 episodes because of censorship, which is one of the key issues with the advertising model is that you have a strong company that is pulling the strings that can that can try and censor what you're saying, um, which is what we see on mainstream television and stuff where they don't want to scare off their commercial providers. Um, but podcasting has always historically been this open system of RSS. But now he moves to this closed system of Spotify. And then from there, um, it they like algorithmically put in ads that just like in the middle of the conversation, just an ad just comes on. And then you can kind of skip it, but you're only skipping that one little algorithmic ad and then they hit you again. And if it's like in your pocket or something, you can't skip it. They make it as difficult as possible to skip it. The natural progression there is they're going to remove the skip button altogether. And it's basically like the Netflix's Netflixization of podcasting. And that seems to be where the industry is going. So if we can have a counterbalance where creators can go and basically say, no, fuck this. I'm not going to do the closed system. I'm going to do an open system, no paywall. And I'm going to get direct support from my audience. The The platform, it doesn't take a 30% cut like Patreon does or whatever Patreon's cut is. I think it's 10. Or like YouTube. YouTube takes a fucking cut when you do like the super chat and all those different things. And the audience just supports you directly. Um, that could give especially early creators and early uh, shows a, a footing to kind of get in the door and do it in an independent way. Um, so I, I look at it. It, it's a necessary counterbalance because the way the industry is going, uh, it just it just does not look great. Yeah, I also I just I think it's good that we've got all these different options for content options. creators. Like yeah. if you know you can try the John Carvalho model, you can go for your model, or you can go for the ad model. I mean, the good thing about the ad model is it 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 gives you the funding to really do interesting things, right? Like you can you know like the production on our thing now when we. It give you an idea when we we're going to go and do a whole month in uh, Texas. We're going to go do a whole month there, and the pl- travel cost, cost while there, cost of the team, it's it's getting close to like a hundred thousand dollar operation for the month. Damn. Yeah, because you've got to rent a place for the month. The place, yeah, you know, and you've got to rent someone that's decent enough. So. You know, it's really weird. When we're on Airbnb trying to find a place, the first thing we're looking for is the, the table that we're going to record at. Like every single property, we're, we're scouring the tables. Is there a good table? Great. Is there a good backdrop? Like, it does it look comfortable? But uh, we've rented a place in Texas and Austin for a month, and it's like, it's 13,500 pounds. So that, what's that, like $18,000? Add in flights, add in food, add in equipment. Maybe not 100,000, maybe like, 60 to 80,000. But like, we couldn't do that before. When I first started this, dude, it was just me with my little case, with my equipment, like doing it in a hotel room or like in your house or something. But the production has grown with the revenue from the sponsors that's allowed us to do things like that. Like, we want to go to 100% in person interviews. Uh, yeah, and but also, I- we're like, I, I, I will, I'm paying for guests to fly in now as well. You know, so like when we were on this recent sprint where I had people, I was like a couple of people, I was like, oh, can we do it remotely? I was like, no, but like I will pay, pay for your flight and a hotel. Like you don't have to cost, it's no cost to you, but you get to come in and do the show. And and that worked. We had uh, we had three people flying. Brandon Quitton flew in. Mark Moss flew in. Somebody else flew I in. I love I think Brandon. Callum, yeah, Brandon's great. Brandon's amazing. But like, um, no, I couldn't I mean, do look, that. On, yeah, on I agree. And me. I think there's a place for high production, you know, high production shows and high production content, right? But as you said, options are good. Um, And I do really think that when you look at the metaphor, because ultimately, I mean, as Bitcoiners, we live in an open source, uh, we're part of an open source movement, Mm. right? And if if you look at the open source movement, it's a very similar situation where we have a few developers that are getting 100K a year, 150k a year from the Krakens and the and the Bitmexes and the OK coins, right? And then there's a bunch of others that like can't pay rent, right? The overwhelming majority can't pay rent, and I think it's very important that we have a sustainable funding model for that other 98 percent, whether that is a content creator or whether that's an open source contributor. It's very important to me and for this movement. And for free open information and tools and whatnot, 
that th th those other 98% have the ability to do it in a relatively independent fashion and connect directly to their audience or their users or, or, or whatever that may be. Do you think it kind of reflects the Bitcoin world and there's like two kind of worlds overlap? There's the, there's the world of people who care about Raspberry Blitz and Seed Sina and listen to Citadel Dispatch and, you know, understand what an XPub is and, you know, run a node. All That's that, what we got you into know. an argument with last yeah. week. <laughs> we, was it XPubs we got into an argument with? It was XPubs, yeah. We got into it. We were pretty drunk. You know, I, uh, it's funny we should talk about that because I actually uh, had to go and get my ex pub. I just derailed you. Are there, are there two different types of Bitcoin? Yeah, but what I'm saying, like I'm saying there's like that, that like kind of hardcore into the tech, into that world, like totally get everything. And then there's like this other world where maybe, you know, maybe they use Gemini or Coinbase and maybe they use a ledger hardware wallet because Cold Card, they maybe think it's a little bit too complicated. And maybe they, you know, Maybe they don't even run a node or they don't custody. It's like it's those who want to get into the weeds and go deep down the rabbit hole. And there's those who just like who want Bitcoin but don't want to deal with all that. And like like my show reflects one audience and yours reflects like the other. There's like and there's that overlap, but that's kind of those two worlds. And you know, you're definitely in that more kind of purest place where it's like, I'm gonna make this work, audience, uh, audience contributions, yada yada. Whereas I'm like, fuck this, give me the ad dollars. <laughs> But like it's it's like two different worlds. First of all, uh, that that's one of the reasons why I I think it's important that we do so many shows together, uh, yeah. because I think both of our audiences can benefit from the different perspective. I think um, so too. But I think I mean there's more than two different types of bitcoiners. There's millions of different bitcoiners of all shapes and sizes, right? And we often get it's easy to get pigeonholed, you know, whatever side you're on, whether you're on like like the Udi, like super mainstream kind of vibe going on, or if you're on like the Bitcoin purist vibe, or you're like, if you don't hold your own keys, you don't use your own node, you're not actually a Bitcoiner. Um, and then there's a million shades of gray in between. Yeah. Um, and I ultimately, what I think is powerful about this movement is, is independence, personal responsibility, and self-sovereignty. Uh, I think that's what makes it, uh, fundamentally unique and special. Uh, that's what differs it from trading stocks on TD Ameritrade or uh, using Venmo to make payments with your friends or PayPal to make payments with your friends. And I think hidden inside of everybody is, is the potential to seek out that personal responsibility and self-sovereignty. So to, to me, I don't have, I try not to, everyone's going to take their own path. It's going to take people different amounts of time. But I think ultimately, you know, 90% of people can get to a relatively self-sovereign personal responsibility kind of place, at least in Bitcoin, because there's such a focus in this industry to, to make it more attainable and more accessible. Uh, and you see that path starting to really develop and get more robust, stuff like the Umbral node, where a purist was, is like, uh, you shouldn't use Umbral. It's not proper free open source software. They use a restricted license, but it's your own node. It's your own node that you can use and you can run your own apps on it, right? And you can, and you, instead of using the cloud, which is someone else's computer, you can use your own computer for it, right? And it's, it's that path. And there's going to be all different projects in between that basically facilitate that path. Um, but, you know, ult ultimately, I think most people can get there. Um, where they end up and where they, you know, where their final destination is, is going to vary as well. Uh, but um, it's it's just we live in a, we live in a world where the overwhelming majority of people have no personal responsibility. Uh, they they have no awareness and they just are just marching around doing what they always do and not really thinking about it. And I think as independent, me and you, as independent media uh, people, as, as independent show creators, uh, education providers in a lot of ways, like it's up to us to kind of help provide them some objective information that they can 
go and decide what to do with that themselves. You know, I'm not going to mm-hmm. tell people what to think. I'm not going to tell people how they should do things. Um, but if they're ready, if they're looking, they can take this information and they can draw conclusions themselves. And I feel like a lot of the issues that we've seen with media, uh, especially modern media lately, is this is how you should think. Uh, corporate media, this is how you should think. This is how you should act. This is and, and the exact opposite. Anyone who does the opposite of that is a fucking enemy. That's that's the wrong way to approach things. The the correct way, the productive way to approach things, the ethical way to pr- approach things is you provide the resources, let people look at those resources, let people make their own conclusions themselves, and everyone's life is different, everyone's perspective is different, and they're gonna they're gonna use that in different ways. This this rise of independent media people is is fascinating. Um, you know, you mentioned Rogan earlier. I talk about him a lot because. The the influence he has now with his show. I, mean, I think that did somebody say his show with that doctor the other day that like forty million people watched it or something. Incredible. Is it still on Spotify? Uh yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I've got two views on it. Like, uh, I think it's amazing. We've got this rise of independent uh, media because it gives people a chance to, you know, if they trust this person to actually listen to a conversation which isn't you know, part of some like a corporate media agenda. But I also think at the same time, like there are independent media people who are falling into the same trap. And I think they're falling into the audience capture trap, uh, whereby, you know, they, they build up an audience around a particular kind of like political part of the political spectrum. And then they appeal to that audience and if I've I've kind of found I like found quite fascinating the kind of to and fro between uh, Tim Paul and Claire from Quillette recently, uh, not siding with either of them. And sometimes I thought Claire had a good point. Sometimes I thought Tim did. But like seeing them like fight, especially Tim Paul, like there seemed to be like some audience capture kind of going on. And and I wonder if it, I wonder if it's it can end up becoming the same fucking problem. Yes. It's the same, like, but in a lot incentive. of ways, in a lot of ways, it can become even more amplified. Yeah, uh, it can become even more of an issue because there's more sources, right? And this is why I keep coming back down to personal responsibility, right? Because ultimately, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, a lot of this stuff is going to come down to both personal responsibility from the content creator and also personal responsibility from the viewer, right? To actually understand their sources, understand biases, right? Because when you when you look at independent media. We see a lot of the same tactics that we see in corporate media. We see the mm. use of fear. We see the the lack of fact checking uh, because in in flam, you know going crazy with headlines and going crazy with with your takes gets you more engagement. Um, we see paternalism where like your audience isn't smart enough to think for themselves, so you're going to tell them exactly how to think because they want you to tell them how to think, right? They you get a bigger audience if you tell them how to think. Um, we see a lot of these same tendencies, and also we see a similar uh, revenue model, which is an advertisement-based revenue model, which is why I think, just to go back, is it's important to also have an option for people to, to fund themselves directly via the audience um, and kind of circum- circumvent that same model. Um, but yeah, we're going to see... We're going to see a lot of the same things that people complain about with corporate media happening in independent media. Uh, the benefit, the main overwhelming net benefit is that there is a major, there's way, way, way more sources. You have way more places where you can get your so-called news or discussion or education or whatever you want to fucking call it. Um, and hopefully people will use multiple sources. They will move around more. There's less lock-in, right? Historically, what? You like turn on the news. You have like four news channels to check. Right now you have a fucking million different podcasts to check, uh, a bunch of blogs, Twitter personalities, everything. But you have to remember at the end of the day, everyone's human and this whole rise of the influencer class and stuff like like a, a, an influencer that is the most effective at, at influencing is someone who makes you rely on them and they try and monetize your relationship to the fullest. Right. And like that is not a person that you should be listening to. But that is a person who's going to have the largest audience, right? So it's going to come down to a lot of personal responsibility on the viewer side and the person who's con- you know actually consuming the media. Uh, 
and it's it's there's no there's no clean answer there, right? It's well, I think it it depends on the it's fine. Yeah, look, you're, you're right. Like there's a lot of sources. It's finding the right ones or the right places to kind of like give your time to. And I think uh, you know I bring him up so often. You brought him up a moment ago, but I bring up Rogan so often because the one thing he's done, like I genuinely believe, whether I agree with him or not, and whether. You know, I think he says something smart or dumb or whatever, or he has a guess I like or don't like. I always believe he's like searching for the truth. I always believe that. I always trust him, and when he says something, I trust he believes it rather than like appealing to the audience. You like he might really... be wrong, but it's not intentional. Yeah, like he might be wrong; it's not intentional, or he might be just trying to find an answer. But I don't think you can ever like pin him to anything like politically. I mean, he often talks about being a liberal, but he has a lot of right-leaning leaning people on his show. And, um, you know, I think I think we need more people like that, more people who are just authentically themselves, searching for the truth, you know, whether you, like, you can disagree with them, but, like, know, you trust that their opinion they're given is, like, their, what they honestly believe. We need more of that. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think someone with his level of platform, um, he does a very good job of trying to remain as ethical as possible. Um, I would say, uh, and I obviously like he is like the godfather of, of modern independent media. I mean, he showed, he showed that there's a successful path there. Right. And that it's, it could be very massively successful. Mm. Um, I'm a bit torn on him lately because of the whole Spotify deal. And I think, you know, he both, he both like helped birth open podcasting as a medium and then kind of was the first one to put the nail in the coffin for it by signing the exclusivity deal with Spotify. Um, Would you so, turn down a hundred million? I don't know. Uh, I'm not going to pretend that I have the answer to that. Um, <laughs> but uh I want my fucking payday Spotify. Come on. If I was Rogan, I, I mean, Rogan was already bringing in a lot of money. Uh, so I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not going to pretend to, to, to say what my decision would be, but it definitely felt like it, 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 it hurt, right? It hurt seeing him go to this exclusivity path. I tend to believe that I would never go. I would just stop doing shows rather than go down an exclusivity path. I like the open nature of the platform of podcasting. I like the open nature of, um, I think all information should be open. I think tools should be open. Um, that's something that I feel very strongly about. It's one of the things that attracted me to podcasting in the first place. Rather, I mean, I have my grandmother. She's like, I don't know how you're still allowed on the radio. You curse all the time. Um, <laughs> and I keep explaining to her. I was like, I'm not, I'm not actually on the radio. That's just how I say it to explain it to you. Hold on. Is that your grandma who like was listening to my show independently of knowing we're friends? Yeah, she listened to... Uh, Defiance, wasn't it? Yeah, I forget which episode it was. Yeah. But she was uh, listening to Defiance and she sent it to me as a recommendation. <laughs> That's so fucking funny, man. All right, what about Bitcoin TV? What have you learned with that? I haven't got any of my shows on Bitcoin TV yet. You're not on Bitcoin TV, bro. No. What's What gives? What are the rules? Bitcoin. Uh, right no now ads. it's Bitcoin. What? No ads. No, no, you can have you can have ads on your actual show. Okay. Um, we're not as a platform. So like when you're on YouTube, right, you have, not only do you have your ads, you have YouTube's ads, right? YouTube's whole business model is surveillance capitalism, right? They're, mm. they're surveilling people. Uh, they're manipulating people. They're controlling people. That is their business model. And they're not just controlling the audiences. They're doing it to the creators as well, right? You're completely at the whim of the creators. So me, Wiz, and BitKite, three Bitcoiners, uh, said, you know, we're, we're fucking done with, with YouTube. So we took, we took PeerTube, an open source alternative uh, to, to YouTube. Um, we spent too much money on the BitcoinTV.com domain. Um, How much did you spend on the Bitcoin TV? I'm comment not there? commenting. Oh, man. And we launched Bitcoin TV on our own servers. We have servers on two continents right now that we host ourselves that are not located in cloud servers. Uh, so we don't have to worry about Amazon, whatnot, uh, censoring us. And 
We are loading it up with the best Bitcoin content we can find. The goal is right now we're making no money whatsoever. We're losing money. I mean, I just, I mean, we just dropped $8,000 on a, on a new server. Uh, it's, it's uh, very expensive to host things. Mm -hmm. Um, the goal is to integrate sats, integrate Bitcoin across the whole stack. So you can support your favorite creator easily with, with lightning and on-chain Bitcoin, um, through various different methods. Um, and at the same time, support us in a similar fashion as an open source project. The, uh, hopefully we can get to a point where you can host instances of Bitcoin TV yourself. Uh, maybe not all the videos, but you get to pick which which videos you host. Um, and the idea is basically just a platform. And so right now it's Bitcoin only. We will never have shitcoin content on it. But I do think there's a place for uh, all other types of content um, that are funded by Bitcoin. So the Bitcoin in the handle is 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 to me means funding uh funding content uh, directly from the audience with Bitcoin. Uh, we have some of the best, you know, Bitcoin content out there right now. Adopting adopting Bitcoin in El Salvador is exclusively available on Bitcoin TV. Uh, we didn't pay for that or anything. They loved our mission. They made it happen. Um, everything is RSS feeds. It's open, similar to uh, podcasting. Uh, so other apps can actually integrate directly and stream stream our content directly into their apps. Um, we're going to add a pub key in there, just like Podcasting 2.0, so you can stream sats from other apps. There's a bunch of different things we're going to do to try and integrate Bitcoin across the whole stack. But basically, the idea was, I mean, look. It's a beautiful we're website. See we're seeing the YouTube censorship issues, right? And, you know... As Bitcoiners, we tend to like get trapped into this whole, you know, decentralize everything. This is not a decentralized project. Like, do we hope that you can run your own Bitcoin TV instances in the future? Yes. Can you federate with other peer tube instances? Yes. So the other instances can help provide That's You can do that. Um, but it is a centralized project, but it's one that's hosted by Bitcoiners for the world. And... Um, as this YouTube censorship gets out of hand, I mean, there's a very good chance that the, by the, the by this time next year, by this time in two years, that the overwhelming majority of Bitcoin content is not available on YouTube. Um, we, I mean, uh, TFTC got, you know, we, I think we're allowed to post now. For the last five days, we haven't been allowed to post on our YouTube. We got our well, first what strike. What for? I mean, uh, Marty interviewed Laser Hoddle and they were like talking about depopulation or something. Um, sure. but my point is, my point remains the same is that YouTube has a very heavy hammer on, um, on their censorship and there's no like real judicial process. We saw Palm's channel got taken down. It's like the most mainstream, like least controversial thing ever. Uh, and, and that's going to happen more often. And is the answer another centralized video platform? No, but the answer is many video platforms uh, that ideally allow creators to get funded directly from their audience. And we hope to be a small part in that, in that, in that mission. You want to kind of pirate bay, you want to kind of pirate bay it. So people, so even if it does get like censored in some way, there's like different instances everywhere. I mean, I don't know what the tech behind that kind of distribution is, but Hey, it's a cool looking website. I should put my shit up there. Yeah, well, we would love to make your channel. Yeah, I'll, let's do it. I'll speak to Danny. We'll do it. And I'll, I'll make sure I get rid of my ads. We'll make it ad free. I mean, that would be awesome. But like yeah. I said, people still have ads up on there. We just, we're not monetizing via ads. And we're going to make it easy for creators to get funded directly from their audience with Bitcoin. And we How will not be taking a cut. It's an optional cut. There'll be like a slider bar. If you want to give us 5%, you know, so we can run our servers, so we can keep it going. 100%. Yeah, but like it, eventually, if it's successful, it won't survive on being a like. I'm ready to prove you wrong, Pete. Well, look, I hope you prove me wrong, but um, yeah, I mean, I think it's fair to give a cut. Like, you provide the platform and the tech, we provide a cut of the the income. I think that's just a fair model. Look, it goes. It goes with. Uh, 
a similar philosophy that I've tried to been embracing this year, which is I want to put, you know, our shoes, our, our myself in the same shoes as open source contributors that are, are providing so much to this space. And Bitcoin TV.com is always going to be an open source project. Uh, it is currently a fork of PeerTube, which is an open source project. Uh, we are going to contribute back to that project. We are going to add plugin support. So anybody running PeerTube is able to add our open source plugins and be able to support uh, content creators directly with Bitcoin. Um, and we will see if we can make a grants and donation approach uh, to making this, this project work. Uh, I think we can. I think it's a harder path, but I think it's possible. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, we might have uh, like some live events, in-person events, stuff like that, that can also provide some funding without necessarily like baking it into a business model. And we'll see how it, uh, we'll see how it works out. It's definitely going to be the harder path. Uh, but I mean, I, I do believe that we will see one of the cool things that people have talked about Bitcoin for a long time is that as Bitcoin appreciates in purchasing power, uh, we will see these ideologically minded Bitcoiners that are that that believe in open information, that believe in in censorship resistant tools, that believe in individual empowerment, that believe in personal responsibility, that will flex their wealth to a degree. And I am fortunate enough to be in the situation where I can dog food and experiment with civil dispatch with BitcoinTV.com um, and try and do it in in a way that I feel like you know, furthers, furthers that goal. And, 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 and that is, is, has been part of my focus this year, a very large part of my focus this year as, as a result. Well, I salute you, brother. Very cool. Hopefully I can make a contribution towards it. I'm sticking with the ad model works for me. I mean, look, we would love if, if we have, if, if your show ends up, you get banned from YouTube, right? You get banned mm. from YouTube and the majority of people are watching your videos on Bitcoin TV.com you will have a very strong incentive to support the project, right? So oh, I want to support it anyway because it's you. I want to but I'm expecting you. creators to also be supporting the project. We already have, you know, we have Nico from Simply Bitcoin. Um, he already reached out. He's like, next time there's a server, I would love to, to, to front the cost of the server because Simply Bitcoin hosts all their content on Bitcoin TV. They had an episode with, uh, with uh, our boy Alex Svetsky the other day where they, they finished the episode and Nico was like, if I post this to YouTube, we are going to get a flag. <laughs> like, we're going to get a flag. We're not going to be able to post for five days. It's a daily show. Like, I need to fucking do it. And they made it a Bitcoin TV exclusive, right? So I, I think there is demand there. Um, I, haven't had a I haven't had a YouTube we'll strike. I like, I'll, I'll front a server for you. We, um, we're Hold always... You to well, I, mean, I, I say we. I mean, we, you know, we... We do make some a lot of donations. I think we've I think we've given out about one hundred thirty thousand dollars on projects this year. Let's stream uh, Bedford FC to BitcoinTV.com. That's a fucking good idea because we're going to start streaming games early next. Like Let's I had, do it. everyone wants to stream it. One part of me is nervous about doing it because I'm like, are these people who watch the Premier League and they've like got this idea that I bought. We like watch the MLS in America. Club. Okay, yeah, I'm but, sure Bedford can compete with fucking. NYCFC or whatever. Dude, this is this is like weekend football. Uh, I'm very proud of the team and I'm very excited about where it could go. But like it's it's low level. But like whatever. These people, there's so many people behind this team now that they, you know, there's hundreds of them who would have probably watched it today if we streamed it. So let me feel, let me yeah, see. I would have watched it. Let me find out because I'm I've got I want to get the game streaming next year. I think it's gonna let's make it happen. We'll be the exclusive yeah. streaming part. I mean, unless you want the money grab and you want someone else to pay, no, no, we won't pay you. No, for no, it. no. I mean, we're gonna pilot test it next year anyway. But like at some point, it will be something we will we'll charge for the streaming because we've got to cover the costs. You know, there is a cost to stream in the games, but it might be. Were you gonna the charge the end user? You're gonna charge the streaming provider. No, this this the end user because there's a cost to us. Well, there's a cost to us to stream the game. We have to like have the you have to have a team to come in with cameras. Right, and I'm film. aware. You we, need like a yeah. like television cameras and stuff. But look, yeah. stream through us. We won't charge you anything. 
No, but um, we t- I said we would test it any like we're going to test it. I'll do it for free the first any games this season, the rest of the season that we stream. Like, well, like what about the ad model, Pete? Uh, potentially, potentially. Just have but, this stream brought to you by company. Yeah, maybe. Well, anyway, I'll look into it. But I'd like to put it. I'd like to stream it through your thing. But well, anyway, we um, have the capabilities yeah. of streaming it. We just we have like I said, we have we have two very high performance servers in two continents right now. So. All right, man. Well, listen, there's loads of other stuff to talk about. I've got a big list here, man. Uh, price-wise, let's not, not talk about price too much. We're yeah, basically the, the same price broken, as February. I think. I think it's broken. We're I'm in new territory. Broken. Yeah, which is cool, which is good. It's kind of interesting. We're nearly flat for the year. We're basically, I think, flat since February. We've never had a top like this in like the four-year cycle or whatever. We and are, I, you know, I'm the first one to admit that I was basing a lot of my thoughts on previous cycles, so... Our price right now is the same price it was of the 9th of February. But when we did, when we recorded last year, we were at like 20K. Uh, last, so re- that would have been released maybe a bit higher. Hold on, end of the year. I don't know when we were, let me see when we recorded it. So we released it on the 1st of January. Uh, but uh, have I got to know when we recorded it? We recorded it on the 30th of December. No, we, did. we were higher. 30th of December, we were at uh, 27,000. Damn. So we're like double. Not even double, actually. No, we're, we're it's less than double. What's the current price? It's like 40, 40 57. It's, yeah, so About it's 80, less than double. Double yeah. would be 54. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, whilst I have a, I have a block lock Should right over there that is, uh, I unplugged it when I moved and I haven't plugged oh. it back in yet because it's at $54,000. It's just sitting there with the wrong price. Got mine here as well. There you go. 3,102 sets a dollar. Uh, but fucking price. Fuck price. I, I think the cycle's broken. I'm okay with the cycle breaking. Like the cycle breaking is a good thing now because it means like we're eternally in different territory. Unless, like somebody else has said, it's like it's not broken, it's just it's being lengthened. But if it's being lengthened, it changes everything because yeah, the previous cycles have been very attached to the having, and we're getting closer and closer to the having. Like mm. we've never had a top like this before. It doesn't the- feel like this is the top of this cycle. But the halving's like narrative now because mine is not selling. Yada yada. You know, it was there like, are I, miners did, like that one sell. I mean, look, a lot of miners have fiat cost. They have rent, they have employee the cost, miners, salaries. The big miners are some of them are like some of them are accumulating and buying and look, everyone talks a big game when the price is up. Yeah. Uh I would like to see what some of these new corporate cuck miners are going to do if we have a eighty percent drawdown. And I just don't see. Well, I don't see an usually. What, but from usually, here. what happens? Like usually, what happens in these cycles, right? Is you see like the eighty percent drawdown, and everyone panics. And I think what, what, on the corporate miner side, what you see is going to be similar to what hap- happened to Ethereum last cycle, where like all the ICO teams were like, "No, we're going down the ship. We're good." And then, like, as the price dipped further, they all panicked and just, like, dumped their, their like, massive bags of ETH. Um, we could see that kind of situation. And then what happens is the having comes in and it's almost like the backstop, right? It's like, it's like, okay, everyone fucking panicked. And now there's less Bitcoin to go around per block and it sell, sellers dry up and then we move back up. Um but we'll yeah, see. I mean, it, it seems like we're on uncharted territory right now. I remain as bullish on Bitcoin as I've ever been. Uh, I'm happy for that. I'm and okay it's weird that. that like people like are like disappointed. And we're, as you said, you know, last time we recorded, we were at 27K. Couldn't yeah. really even dream of uh, 48 or whatever the fuck we're at right now. It's because we, we Look I, at think, us. I think most people thought we were going to break 100K this year, right? I mean, I had 200k by conference day. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I've won my bet of Hodor. I've won another half a Bitcoin off him. Yeah. I mean, that was a good bet. That was a good bet. I think that was an easy bet to take. But I offered him another good bet <clears throat> about it was about two, three months ago. I texted him. I said, "I think I've won this bet, but I've got another bet with you." 
I said uh, under over 100k by the end of the year, double or quits. He didn't take it. I think that was a that would have been a good bet as well. I actually thought I thought I would have. I thought I mean, there's obviously. a chance I would lose it. But you know, when I when we got up to 69k, I was like, my expectation is we were going to go up higher. The fact that we kind of went there and back down again was a bit like, uh huh, okay, interesting. It's a little bit weird. Yeah, a bit weird, but fuck it. All right, man. Look, so much other shit to talk about. Let's talk about a tip. let's talk about Elon Musk. It's a big deal this year. It's been a long fucking year. Yeah. But uh, Tesla comes in. When was that? February? Yeah, buys 1.5 billion of Bitcoin. It's like, whoa, Caught shit. us all off guard. I never saw that fucking coming. Even though he was, like, engaging with Sailor. I didn't... I mean, like, if they'd have come out and said, yeah, we bought 100 million, great. 1.5 billion. I was like, fucking holy shit. That's a, that's a big buy. And I know nice they sold dip a bit. your foot in. Yeah, and I know he rug pulled us a little bit, but at the same time, but I thought that might be the trigger for others. I thought that might be the trigger for. Yeah, others. I mean, it was an S and P five hundred company. Mm. I think were they they weren't in the S and P five hundred yet. They got in shortly after that. I can't remember. Um, which is you know top five hundred companies uh, rated by someone. Uh, Standard and poor. Yeah, Standard, whoever, but Standard & Poor's like owned by a conglomerate or something. I don't know. Whoever owns yeah. them. Um, one of the most valuable companies in the world, one of the richest men in the world, runs the company. Presumably the he bought some himself. World. Yeah, it was a big fucking deal. And it was a very big, uh, it was a leapfrog, right? Because you see a small tech company like MicroStrategy run by a billionaire, but a lower tier billionaire uh, buy Bitcoin, right? And that's what we always see. You always see the challengers. It's always the mm-hmm. challengers that get started, right? I'm um, sure so we're going to talk about El Salvador. It's always the challengers. And we've got um, three now. It's not the ones who are in front. You don't see Google do it. You see MicroStrategy do it. You don't see Venmo do it. You see Cash App do it, right? You don't um, see the US do it. You see El Salvador, El Salvador. do it. Right. You don't see Manchester United do it. You see Bedford fucking FC do it. Fuck yeah, exactly. Or Fuck like yeah. Perth Perth baseball team. <laughs> Perth baseball. Uh, the yeah. Perth Heat in Australia. Yeah. They fucking um, front run me. Yeah, they front ran you a little bit. But you had you were already thinking about the idea at that point. I remember. Anyway. Dude. Um so it did leapfrog a bit, but also at the same time, like Tesla and Elon are, aren't really in the financial community. They're treated differently. Uh, they're not really treated as like, a, I, I rightfully so, I would say, like an old guard, blue chip. Like if a GE or someone did it, it probably would have been a bigger deal. Uh, and we didn't see people follow suit. We didn't really nope. see other companies follow suit. We saw small companies like, to like uh, was it Tahini's in, uh, yeah. in Canada, right? Like you see like small companies do it. Um, but... We don't. We we didn't really see. I expected. Uh, I didn't expect Tesla, and then after Tesla happened, I expected a whirlwind, mm-hmm. and we got like nobody, nobody. Um, but at the same time, you know, eight months later, ten months later, all of a sudden, like inflation is like a mainstream topic. Yeah. Um, Sailors being invited on all the mainstream shows. He was on Tucker Carlson, which is the number one news show. Mm-hmm. in america for better or worse and, and that interview seemed to resonate with a lot of people um i th- i mean i guess one aspect of this is that the accounting is kind of fucked up so if the price goes down they have to mark it as losing money but if the price goes up they can't mark it as a profit on their corporate balance sheet which is like malicious regulation who's surprised with that um but in general, I would say, look, at the end of the day, I think it's better. It's it's If you care about the little guy, it's better that this didn't cause a cascade yet. There will be a cascade at some point. Um, and there will be a FOMO and a r- rush to the, to the on-ramp of Bitcoin and to get out of fiat. Uh, but the longer that lasts before that happens and the little guy... And we can keep stacking and and keep accumulating Bitcoin that the small business, small businesses around the world can start accumulating Bitcoin, the better, right? Like we don't really want, I mean, 
I, I personally do not. I won't speak for you. I personally don't want these large companies to have massive Bitcoin holdings on their balance sheet um, sooner. I'd rather yes. wait. I'm, not, I'm like, ask me, do you want Bitcoin to go to 300K? Of course I do. But do I care? Nah, not really. Like, I'm okay now. Like, life's good. I can I can travel to the US every six weeks. I can make my shows. I can go on holiday with the kids. Like, I, I think, if, I, I talked about on the show before, Matt, I think there's a thing with money. It's like, once you've covered the basis, like, you can do what you want. Like, you can go and get your weekly shopping and not worry about your budget. Or if you need to get on a plane tomorrow, you can buy that plane ticket. Everything else that you need money for after that is just lumpy shit. Like, property, helicopter, car, like, it's lumpy shit. You know, you don't like once you've got to that point. So I'm like, I'm okay, man. Like, whatever. Bitcoin can, Bitcoin can do whatever. I'm fine now. I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy whatever happens. But I'm with you. It's kind of like I actually want the little countries to get in a bit more. Yeah, little countries, little companies, little people. Like, let's let's let the little guys should have a little bit more time. Yeah. Uh, and like I don't make the rules. I don't know how much time they have. I feel like time is of the essence. Like you gotta fucking rush in. I still feel FOMO. I'm basically all in. Uh, I'm like as all in as you can be without like leveraging yourself. Um don't do leverage kids. <laughs> exactly. Uh but you know, the more the more time the better in that regard. I, I would uh the longer it takes for Goldman Sachs to start accumulating Bitcoin, the fucking better. And I think that should just be consensus opinion. Fuck you, Goldman Sachs. Okay, let's talk about El Salvador. You brought it up. We don't need to do too much. Like, it's probably been this the is most the biggest talked news about. Of the year. It is. I'm the most talked about news of the year. And we got a Citadel Dispatch hat in the president's office. Fuck yeah. You're welcome, brother. Got it in the photo. Um, we both fucking we we had to sit on that together because we both went to the Indy 500 with the strike mm-hmm. team. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We had to sit on that news. I just didn't like because I was filming it. Uh, but I've got a second interview that I'm waiting to get out with Bukele. But this film, the film I made, has been delayed. I saw that I saw the cut today, so it's going to come out in January. Once that's out, I'm going to release the second interview because it was a more challenging interview with him. I asked him some tougher questions. Uh, interesting situation, interesting country, interesting leader. There is definitely. I think. Do you know what it is? I think. Hmm. What is, what's the question I want to ask? Are we as Bitcoiners sometimes? Not when I say us. Like, are there people who are slightly hypocritical with El Salvador? Are like, are we? Do we want it to be such a success? And it, I don't mean you. I just mean like yes. various people that we're not actually being yes. as critical as we should be because. I felt the pressure, right? Having a relationship with the president, which is, by the way, fucking weird to turn around. Yeah, I got a relationship with this president. It just fucking doesn't make any sense. But like I've done two interviews and I want a third one. I felt, when I went to do the second one, I felt like under pressure. I was like, wait, if I piss him off, does that mean I never get a third interview? Do you feel like you're watching your your yourself right now when you talk about it? No, I'm okay with it now. A I've come bit? to terms with it. Yeah, but no, just no, because like I came to terms with the fact that I might never... Go- then I don't know if I'll ever go again. Like I want to go again, but I, if it, if doing like doing my job properly means I wouldn't go again, I I, I accept that. That's good because I've 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 been there. Like I was the first to go. I went when no one gave a shit, and I kept going back and I did my interviews. But like, it was when I was doing the second interview, I was really fucking nervous because I like asked some tough questions. Like I asked him, "Is he a dictator?" And I challenged him about some of his Because every dictator just says, yeah. Yeah, but like it was more of a case of like <laughs> I, I, I was accused of being a softball. Uh, I got accu- I got threatened with violence and accusations from opposition people out there because they said I was like in business with them. I was like I felt a lot more pressure on the second interview than the first one. Uh, but like I've come away from it thinking I still like him. I think he's definitely going to run a second term that's clearly against the Constitution but it makes sense because I don't think one term's long enough. Does he do a third or a fourth term? I don't know. Uh, but we've, you know, hero worshipped him, and in some ways, rightly so, he's done some amazing things. Well, massively, 
well, massively bold to do what he did with Bitcoin. That's a massively bold thing. Yes. And actually, he has delivered change. Look, I went down to the uh, the close to a red zone in El Salvador, like somewhere you don't normally go to. And admittedly, I had armed guards, but I asked the people there. I said, "What it's like here now?" And they're like, "You can you can have your phone out of your pocket in the streets now. You can do it before someone will snatch it or fucking shoot you." You know, the murder rate has massively dropped. Violence is massively... Like, he has definitely delivered for that country in certain ways, but, like... Benevolent dictator type of thing. Potentially, but, like, don't all dictators start out as benevolent? But the, the bigger question Not is, the bad like... ones. <laughs> but, but the bigger question is, like, some of the Bitcoin stuff's a bit shit. The Chivo wallet is a bit shit. So... Yeah, what's been going on with that? So I mean, I've been I get shit from a lot of people in the Bitcoin community because I've been very critical of Bukele. Um, I 100% agree with you. Extremely bold what he did in the first place, um, accepting Bitcoin as legal tender, being the first country to do it. Now there's other countries that are stacking, that are stacking Bitcoin, stacking Sats, Venezuela, North Korea. They don't let their people also get the benefit of Bitcoin. They of just course. fucking in Venezuela they steal people's they miners. They steal it. Yeah, people have yeah. That, people have fled their the country because exactly. And then they shit release stolen. a shitcoin, and then they try and make their people use a shitcoin, right? So it's important yeah. to realize uh, that that he's done a lot of good for his his people. Like it it appears that way to me as someone who unfortunately has not been down there yet. I need to make it down there. I've been dealing with a lot of my own personal things and travel bullshit and whatnot have not made it down there yet and I need to, but as someone from the outside looking in, he has done a lot of good. Um, At the same time, first off, he didn't have his own currency to begin with. He was using the US dollar, right? He was using someone else's shit coin. Uh, So he he didn't lose any kind of element of control adopting Bitcoin as legal tender. The second thing is the Chiva wallet itself is a classic. Can, can I cut in there? He didn't, but like he put himself at loggerheads with the most powerful government in the world with the biggest army. 100%. So he might not have had, but like he got, he got a lot of leverage and a close relationship with the US because well, of that. Well, yeah. I mean, everyone, all small countries and large countries are worried about America, right? America is, we, we throw our dick around. Uh, we, we attack countries, uh, we're unjust, and and it, it is what it is, right? People are, are scared of America's, America's reach. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, look, everyone's scared of the United States. We're the land of KYC, especially if you're doing finance things. They're going to, like, fuck with you, right? We saw they went out to Arthur Hayes and BitMEX and whatnot. Um. The thing is, so so they didn't have their own currency. They were using the U.S. dollar. They were using, they were using someone else's shitcoin to begin with. They add Bitcoin as legal tender, but they also at the same time are basically attempting to to digitize the whole economy of El Salvador. That was a very cash based economy that he didn't he wasn't able to track right. Mm. And the Chiva wallet is basically that classic central bank digital currency strategy, right? Which we're seeing China try and implement. We're going to see America try and implement. We're going to see Europe try and implement where they can track, control, trace, seize, block everyone at will, inflate it all at will, do all kind of funny business. That's the beauty of of, of these central bank controlled currencies. And the Chiba wallet basically is a vessel for that in a better form because it is supposed to work with the greater open monetary network that is Bitcoin. Now, it doesn't really work that well with the greater open monetary network that is Bitcoin, but I think that is mostly due to, like he decided like in three months he was going to fucking implement this thing. And like mm-hmm. I've talked to some of the teams involved, like they had like six days notice to like make it happen. And it's probably mostly incompetence, but it is something to keep an eye on. We don't want... We also don't know what the ownership of the Chiva wallet is. It's like owned by some LLC or some company that is probably tied to the administration that is going to make a bunch of money off of it. Um, but that is that is the biggest pain point to me. The biggest yep. pain point to me is, Matt, I mean, I talk in my book, right? Like I care about Bitcoin users having good privacy and having a centralized custodial wallet that is always going to be able to outcompete 
free open source solutions, sovereign solutions, because they can waive fees. They're the government. They can just, they can say you can instantly convert into the U.S. dollars and you don't have to pay any fees and they can encourage you basically through their, their government mandate uh, to, to, to use their wallet over some other wallet. Um, they're going to have more control there. And that is something to keep an eye on. Uh, we're Bitcoiners. We're not supposed to, I mean, to me, we're not supposed to be trusting politicians at their word. You should be verifying. You know, I don't whiskey, trust verifying. I can join the whiskey now. Salute, brother. Cheers. Is this your first whiskey of the episode? Yeah, because I, I had a wine. Uh, I hadn't been drinking a lot re- recently. Um, and I'm careful. I don't want to get as drunk as we did last time because we just fucking I know, but we're other. an hour and ten minutes in. You just fought. Cheers. Yeah, no, but I'm drink, drinking wine, mate. I'm drinking. It's, it's cheers. Fun. Cheers. I think, I'm, I think this will be Eagle and Is it Eagle Envy? Angel's Envy? Angel, Angel's Envy. Or what's the Eagle one? There's an Eagle... Uh, I don't know. There's an eagle one, though. I, I was in uh, Texas, uh, Austin, when we hit. Is there an eagle high? eye? I don't know what it is. Maybe, yeah. I uh, when we hit an all-time high, I had to go get my hair cut. And there was a place next door, it was like a whiskey bar, and I went in. I was like, "What's the most expensive whiskey you have?" And there was like a three hundred dollar glass of whiskey, and I was like, "Fuck it, I'm doing it." When we hit sixty nine thousand, I was like, "Fuck it, I'm gonna do it." And I had a three hundred dollar glass of whiskey. And- you caused the dump. I caused the dump. I, well, I caused the first dump when I called out Elon, and I caused the second dump with my three hundred dollar whiskey. I basically caused every fucking dump. But this, I was like, because in my head, I always wanted to know. It's like, really, is there that much of a difference, like between like a five dollar glass and a three hundred dollar glass? Like, like I'm assuming once you get above twenty five dollars a glass, you 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 can't fucking tell. Yeah, yeah there's a awesome. uh, there's a plateau the spot there. No, I tell you, this thing was awesome. It's like every sip was an experience because you just felt it like go through your body. Fuck knows what it did to my liver, but but anyway, back to Bukele. So there's a few my things I think he should... like the seventy dollar bottle. I like the seventy dollar bottle. Yeah. Well, when we're in Austin, I'm going to take you for a glass of this stuff. My treat to you, man. But listen, Bukele, there's a few things I think he should do, and this is based on the decision to run my football club as a uh, you know a Bitcoin company. Is he an investor in the football club? No man, come on! I did, I did uh, tweet at him, like asking if we can, if like I'll basically take the team out to El Salvador. I want, I want to play in the national stadium against San Salvador, and I think we call it the Volcano Cup. I think we do that shit. You can get like the best players from El Salvador to join the team. Well, maybe, but anyway. So there's a few things I think he should do. I think, firstly, I think they should retire the Chivo app and. Like bring in a, a, a good Bitcoin company to to migrate people across. I just think they should do that. Get rid of Chivo, and that's cool. Like just allow people to accept if they want to buy or sell. There's a spread. Just just deal with that. No, I mean I. Okay, continue. Yeah, that's that, that's the first thing. Uh, well, the second. Uh, so thing, let me counter the things individually. Okay. The issue there is right. If you're going to force everyone to accept Bitcoin as legal tender. Yeah then the government should give you a government subsidized way of converting that into us dollars like i like there is there is a there's a solid argument for why chivo exists in the first place right no i get i get the argument every merchant has to accept bitcoin so every merchant should have a low fee way of converting that to dollars if they don't want to accept bitcoin all right privatize it get someone like ibex to run it and they suffer the costs but like, take it out of control of the government, so the gov- government just aren't in- involved. I think I think that would be a smart move. The I mean, I would prefer one, that. I agree. So I think he should make the government's wallet address public. Now, I've, the reason I say I've done that, I don't. Did, did you see the tweet storm about the vision for my football club? You probably didn't no. read it. If you did, I did a tweet storm. I put the presentation out slide by slide. But one then I was like, this is our bank balance. This is what we've got coming in on invoice and this is our bitcoin treasury and here's the wallet address so like people at any point can it's very hard to allow people to do that with your bank account because all you can do is take a screenshot right right but with our bitcoin treasury here's here's the wallet address and i think that address should be public and i'm going to tell people how the multi-sig works like i'm going to do this as transparent as possible and i just think some more transparency is needed well you don't want to say who holds it who holds it no no i'm going to talk about how we, not who holds it how we do it like What's the service we use? Yeah, yeah I like the yeah, idea. Yeah. Well, yeah. You don't need a but service. A bit Do like, yourself. you know, when 
you know when I used to do those transparency reports for the podcast? You do a great I, job with that. I, I got rid of them, though. I, t- I got rid of them. i tell you why. I, th- I know. I, I'm not, I was out with Jason was Williams. Year? Yeah, I was out with Jason Williams and Hod- American Hoddle and um, Sean Colkin shooting shit in the desert, and they, they were like, just take that off there. Like, you're giving yourself risk that you don't need to. And I liked being open, but I was just like, I thought it, it was one of the best parts of your of your of your show and your brand behind the uh, new year's shows with Matt Adele. but yeah look i like doing it matt but like it just brought so much heat on me and, and then anger and jealousy and shit like i just it made so, it, i know i'm a hypocrite for a while. right because i don't have the transparency reports for my show but i appreciated yours but we're going to do exactly the same for the football club and that's a different thing because that's a different entity right that's a that's a it's not just a well, why is that not a run. negative for the football club but it's a negative for the show because I think the show is me, and therefore it's, it's seen as me, and every dollar it makes is seen as my money. But you, even want though the, I've got a team. you want the club to be a, a community thing. Yeah, I'm not going to get paid by the club. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to take a salary. I'm not going to get paid by it. So like, there's You're not no going to get part- any money out of the club. I mean, look, if I get them in the Premier League... You're just going to have the private jet. I'm not going to get paid, right? There's, I don't need a salary. <laughs> but like, if if I got them in the three hundred dollar glasses of whiskey, but not going to get paid. <laughs> no, no, no. But like, if we if we <laughs> if we if we're successful and like somebody tries to buy the club in twenty years, and I'm like, you know what, I'm done. Let's hand it over. Yeah, I mean, my shareholder be worth something. You know, I can sell it to some Saudi prince. But like right now, I, I have no. So I I want to be. I'm going to do exactly the same transparency reports. It's going to be more transparent than the podcast. The podcast was a good test. But like what I'm saying is that I think if you're going to operate a Bitcoin treasury and be that kind of company and be bold, it's it's good to be transparent. And I think Bukele needs to be a little bit more transparent on that. There, I mean, that's another thing I think he. Fuck's sake, that's another thing I think he needs to do. Um, and I think he also. He's not going to be. Yeah, I know. I know. These are just the things I think. This These is like the, the politics dictator kind of. And then I think he right? should be compl- like transparent about like his future, like what he's going to do. Yeah, look, I am going to run one more term because I think I should. I'm definitely not. We're going to change the constitution. Yeah, yeah, I know. And the, you know, we're going to change the constitution, whatever. Like, so I can never run again. My worry is that it becomes a third term, fourth term dictatorship bullshit. Brings his sister a, in, his sister yeah. does a term, then he comes back for a term, then his brother takes a term. Because it's high risk. This becomes a big stain on Bitcoin, right? Yeah, I like mean, if it goes I, bad. Look, I mean, I think the stain is is it is is individual stain. Look, Bitcoin's for enemies. We can't stop anyone from using Bitcoin. Yeah. North Korea, like I said, North Korea, Venezuela, Russia, they're already using Bitcoin. Um, you know, we like we cannot stop them. We hear this about uh, the far right in America. They're using Bitcoin. Can't stop them. That's the fucking point, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, someone who is is hiding the fact that they're gay in Iran versus a far right person in America will both use Bitcoin and the Iranians can't stop the person who's pretending to be gay, and we can't stop the far right person in America. That is the fucking beauty of the whole fucking system. Pretending to be um, straight, I think. But the important part, I think, is that people that are influential in Bitcoin should be, you know, consistent with that. That we have no control here. Uh, you know, there is, there is, there is, there is no person that can decide or entity that can decide who uses bitcoin who doesn't um and the stain will more be on people who decide to kind of blindly associate themselves with certain identities Mm -hmm. um yeah well we're gonna have him at we're gonna have him at the conference so so i've never said this publicly i i tweeted about it kind of um does it change your perspective? So El Salvador has two uh, sets of Bitcoin, right? They have Bitcoin held in Chivo. We have no idea where that's held. Uh-huh. Well, they, well, there's some suspicions where it's held. Um, and then what, what we have... Those, what are those suspicions? I don't really want to... Uh, uh, there's certain companies that are running those wallets. Yeah, yeah. Right? Um I don't want to blow up those companies' spots. 
right now, but there's there's certain companies that are running those wallets. Then you also have him tweeting out, I've just bought the dip. The bought the dip is a different wallet. That bought the dip wallet I have on very good record is is held by an American custodian, American regulated custodian. I like know the regulated custodian. I I, I think it's like uncouth to say which one. Yeah, I think I know who it is. Does that change? It's weird, right? Because you said it yourself. You're like, okay, he was using the U.S. dollar, and now he is going against using the U.S. dollar with this independent currency that is separate of of, of world governments and corporations, Bitcoin. Um, but, and he tweets anti-American things sometimes. But then he keeps his Bitcoin, his country's Bitcoin, his Bitcoin in a, in America, without holding his own keys. Yeah, like that's a weird. There's something weird going on there, right? Well, I mean, everything's speculation unless you know. But I think I know what your speculation is, and I think it's right. But at the same time, I wonder mm. what checks and balances they've got to protect themselves from that. It's not like the UK, which holds Venezuela's gold and just is refusing That's exactly to give it back. what it is. Well, it's slightly different. Like, we're holding their gold as, as a government and refusing to give it back while Maduro's in power. Like, this is a, this is a company. So, and I don't know the, we don't know the kind of redundancy they've got in place for what happens to that Bitcoin. Like if someone comes and knocks on the door and says, you have to give it to us, they might be able to say, they might have said, well, we can't because of like one of the keys is held here. Like we just don't know. It's all speculation. But My like, understanding if, is it If it's is. completely 100% hold by who you, I think you think it is, where I think it is. <laughs> yeah, so it's a, it's a risk. It's a different kind of risk, but it's a risk. It's weird, right? Of course, but like. Like he's better I, off just having a cold card and just holding it on the cold card. But are they custodying it or are they just buying the dip for him? Is he like texting them and saying, send me this, buy some of this, we'll wire the money? My understanding is that he he buys his Bitcoin on his phone uh, <laughs> and um, they hold custody for him. Is he is he like DGen leverage trading on BitMEX? No. Um, no. I think you know which company I'm talking about, but it's it's a it's an American regulated company. I know. We'll talk we'll talk about it afterwards. Like we'll, we'll confirm companies. Yeah. Actually, I'm going to text you. And you can just give me a nod if I'm right. Wow, you're such a boomer. It takes you forever to text. No, like uh, I had voice a chat on, so as I was like typing, it had written out some of the stuff I was saying to you. Nope. Oh, interesting. Hmm. Ah, interesting. I thought it was the first one. But either way, it doesn't really matter if it's I one mean, or the other. Which, if which, whichever one it is, it's the same point. Yeah. The, my my point is is that there's an American regulated company holding his, mm. holding the country's keys. And like yeah, I've been I, getting I, shit for this, right? Because I've given, I've given, I've asked Sailor, does he have a fiduciary responsibility to MicroStrategy shareholders? to control his own keys. And maybe MicroStrategy has less of a fiduciary responsibility because if the US government decides to fuck with them, they're a publicly traded company. They're going to get fucked with regardless of how they hold their keys. Yeah, and they're fuck but they're fucking their But own, with El Salvador the, it's yeah. different, right? El Salvador it feels like the Venezuelan gold in UK kind of thing where like the UK won't give Venezuela their their rightful gold right now yeah billions of dollars it is slightly different from asking the fed to custody their keys and a private company just a little a bit difference. though it's not that much i mean it's just like we, one extra phone call if they know where it is it is you and i thought it was two different company uh, companies then no but i'm right you're wrong mm, no i think you're right now you've told me i think you're right but like that's who i thought it was <laughs> Yeah, I don't know, man. Look, I think the whole thing's weird. It's not, it's not, you know what? It, the thing with Bukele, right? He is surprisingly very Bitcoin, but disappointingly not enough Bitcoin in some of the ways he's doing things. So, like, he speaks the right language when he's on Twitter. 
He's been very bold. There's, there hasn't been too much shit coining. We know there's a little bit, but there hasn't been too much. And like, it is the Bitcoin law, yada, yada. You know, he promotes Bitcoin at events. Uh, he's coming to the Bitcoin uh, uh, in uh, Bitcoin 2022. But at the same Keynote. time, there's, yeah, yeah, Keynote. I'm hope I'm first sitting president to ever speak at a Bitcoin conference. Well, he shouldn't be doing a presentation, that's for sure. It definitely needs to be a fireside. Yeah, who do you think should be uh, doing I the fireside? Should fucking, I should fucking <laughs> do that. And I think that's obvious. Well, I'm not in charge clear. of programming. I just advise. I've made my uh, – I, <laughs> I will make my views. No, but I think, like, it would make sense, me and him, to, to, to rattle through it. I, I know him. He knows me and yada, yada. But that's by the by. You know, he does all that, but then there's just these other bits you're like – you know, I'm probably going to run through how we run Bitcoin within the football club by you. Like you're the you're the guy, right? And I'm going to say, look, Matt, this is how we're going to custody it. This is how we're going to run our treasury. This is how we're going to accept Bitcoin. Yada yada. Are we doing this right? Are we are we being a a beacon of what a Bitcoin standard company should be doing? Like you would be a good person to test it by. Yeah, I'm 100 percent down to do that. And that's the bit they're missing. They're not a beacon in terms of like execution. That's what's weird. But, yeah. but the weird part is, is like, so I say, I tweeted out, you know, have it on good authority that Bukele is keeping his keys in America on a, in a, in a regulated company, right? Did he reply? No, of course not. He didn't. Does I he tagged him. Does he follow you? No. Okay. But I had people, I had Bitcoiners come out like, who the fuck do you think you are that he should tell you how he's storing his Bitcoin. And I'm I I that was not my point. Like I don't I don't think that he should tell me how he stores his Bitcoin if he doesn't want to tell me how he stores his Bitcoin. I intentionally did not publicly broadcast who he's storing it with because I respect that. Mm -hmm. But between me and a fucking shit ton of other Bitcoiners, there's plenty of us that are willing to sit down and discreetly help you know, store it properly and store it in a, in a way that respects the citizens of this fucking country. You know, he's got, he's got 7 million Salvadorans that are going to rely on this, on this nest egg of Bitcoin. That's, I thought that's why Bitcoiners were excited about Bitcoin, about El Salvador buying the dip in the first place. Yeah. It was this idea that this country is going to have this endowment forever of Bitcoin that is going to help you know, create a Bitcoin city and create a flourishing Bitcoin country and 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 make it into what it's going to be. Yeah, but so Matt, 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 the Matt, help Matt. is there. The help is available. Matt, it's uh, like the it's Matt. Listen, make it's it like, happen. It's like the Elon Musk thing, right? Where people are like, shut up, don't insult Elon, don't piss Elon off. He might yeah, dump. It's and ridiculous. Like, it's like, what the fuck? Shut up. Who the fuck are you? Like, yeah, it's great that he's in Bitcoin. But he's fucking pumping doggy coin and he's rug pulling Bitcoin on the ESG stuff. His one good Bitcoin thing is they bought 1.5 billion of Bitcoin. Everything else has been fucking shit. You know, he 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 has been a he is a terrible Bitcoiner outside of that 1.5. He's like he's a worse Bitcoiner than me. Uh and so you're so proud. <laughs> there's not many. There's not many, dude. But like he's a uh, he he he's been shit. But people are like, shut up, don't piss off Elon. And like we've got people like Max Kaiser going out and doing the fuck Elon tour, which is great. Like I think Bukele is one that really splits me because I listen to Alex Gladstein and I'm like, yeah, I can't disagree with anything you're saying. And I listen to you and I think, yeah. I can't disagree with what you're saying into well, as well in terms of like custody and shit. But I also think if he gets this right, like if he if he really nailed this, how good it will be. So I don't think it's like a fuck Bukele thing, like it's a fuck Elon thing. It's like a come on, Naib, like let's get this shit in place. Like let's you be the template for every other country. You be the change that we want other countries to see. Hundred percent. Look, I would like. To live in a world where the first country that accepts Bitcoin as legal tender doesn't lose it due to custodial risk, <laughs> like that, that would Bitcoin will be fine, but that would be fucking annoying. Yeah, fuck yeah. I I prefer not to 
oh, look, the same thing that happened with gold happened with Bitcoin. Yeah. You know, it got seized. He decided to talk some shit and boom, U.S. government seized it. Um, like, I prefer, I prefer that didn't happen. Um, but I would go further and say, look, if Elon wanted help with his Bitcoin understanding, I would sit down with him. Of course you would. <laughs> I mean, it's Elon Musk. Of course you would. <laughs> But, nah. but my, my my point what are you is, doing, what, are you, what are you doing on Friday? Can you can you come down to Austin? And you'd be like, Nah, sorry, Elon. Uh, sorry, I'm too busy. I'm busy, man. I'm recording a Citadel dispatch. Like, okay, that is fair. But also, my point is, is that there's there are a shit ton of Bitcoiners that care. Yeah, I know, I know. That want to see things being done the right way, right? And whether that's Real Bedford or whether that's El Salvador or whether that's Elon. That's the case. All right. And has Elon's shit with the with Dogecoin been fucked up? Yes, 100%. Yeah. Um, he's also shouting on Web3, right? He could be worse. Our bar is very low. We have a very low bar for billionaires. We have a very low bar for presidents. You can come in. You can be an absolute dictator, have massive, horrible COVID policies. You know, if you decide to make Bitcoin legal tender, all of a sudden, Bitcoin is like you. Right, we have, like there we have, is. We have a very low bar for Bitcoin podcast host. Very low bar. <laughs> very low bar. <laughs> hey, listen. Uh, let's segue there. Uh, do you know why I like doing interviews with you, Matt? Because it's like it's not really an interview. We just talk, and like we, we've done an hour and a half of barely thinking. Uh, but let's segue because you mentioned Web three, and I want to talk about Web three. Oof. Yeah, and I uh, Web four is the future, dude. And I just want to make a point because some guy was like saying to me the other day on Twitter, he's like, you're just copying Jack. I was like, look, motherfucker. And I showed him the tweets. I've been on this since 2019. And I was having a pop at Tushar from Multicoin about it early 2020. Like this Web3 stuff is pissing me off. It's pissing me right off because it's basically, it's, it's the new ICO, right? Well, I mean, ICOs were part of Web3. There was no Web3 in 2017. They've been retrospectively um, fitted to Web3, but it's just No, I like, think there was. I mean, I was getting slides about Web3 at that point. I mean, my first things I heard about Web3, bear in mind, I like owned a web company when we transitioned through the like a Web2 period into the Web2 period, was like Web3 will be about decentralization, data ownership. That's what it would be about. When it was first like discussed, there was... There was no real crypto talk back then. I mean, Bitcoin existed, but nothing else. It, there's no infrastructure like this. We, I mean, I when did I, I got married in 2013 and my company quit in 2014. So like back 2010, 11, 12, that was when like the first Web3 stuff was discussed. It was like, what's coming next? Decentralization and data ownership. And now Chris Dixon... H16Z are massively pushing this. And I'm, I don't know why Chris Dixon hasn't blocked me, but uh, Mark Angel... Did you see the tweet he deleted? Has? No, what did it say? I like, tweeted it out. It was like six, he deleted it six hours after. It's like, read, write, own keys. Read, write, own keys. I mean, it was just funny because he deleted it. It was like, in Web3, the VCs get to delete their tweets. Um, so like the whole, oh. the whole point of this, this concept of Web3 is this idea that Web 2 is a situation where you have Twitter and Facebook and whatnot. And Web 3 is this idea that you own your own data and you can move with it wherever you want to go. Um, and it's brought to you by the same people who branded using someone else's computer as the cloud. It's and a you marketing get a, term. You, you get a share of the upside because you can own the tokens. And but But the key aspect is own your own data. But yes, then they also show you the token and say you can own the token as well. Um, it's a marketing term. It's bullshit. But it's co it's a co-opted term. It's, Firstly, it's, it, it's the it same was, thing as Web 2. The VCs own everything. Well, so Web, yeah, but Web 2 wasn't about it being Twitter or Facebook. That wasn't what Web 2 was about. Web well, 2, it wasn't called Web 2 at the time. <laughs> no. <laughs> Web look, 2 I'm, was only called Web 2 for Web 3. Right, to listen. I'm going to tell you the fucking tweet I put out because I'm, I'm, I was quite proud of this, to be honest. Right, here we go. So this dude, he was like, because I put out a tweet saying, uh, where is it? Oh, yeah. So 
Chris Dixon put out the quote, tokens are the native asset class of information networks. Brad, USV. And I put tokens are the native asset class of venture capital bullshit. And this guy was like, Hugh McCormack, blindly copying Jack's narrative, having an original thought for once. I was like, well, fuck you, I'll prove it. So this is a tweet I put out September the 9th, 2019. Anyone defining Web3 usually has something to sell. Web3 will reflect the buyers, not the sellers. It will only be defined in retrospect. Don't trust funds defining Web3. Right? You understand? Like, I'm basically saying what you just said there. Yeah. It's like, we will know it once it's hit. But here we are, where Chris Dixon is trying to find what it is because that's where they want to put their money in these fucking projects where they get to IPO at the same size, at the same stage as they do their seed investment without proven product market fit. Solana is a great case study. Yeah, I mean, they like single handedly made multi coin what multi coin is. Um, but it's annoying because it's not driven. They're not driving what they think. The like problem Web3. is, the problem is, Pete, is the whole revolution that's happening here is censorship resistance, specifically state resistance, right? Um, this idea that what are we seeing with Twitter right now? We're seeing Twitter showed that they have control over their platform. So regulators and people uh, that are pressuring the regulators want to see Twitter censor people that they disagree with, right? Because they can. Um, so the biggest issue with quote unquote Web3 is this idea that venture capitalists in America, venture venture funds in America can can monetize these networks and yeah. they can make an ROI. And those venture funds themselves are the weak point, right? Like if you have control over a network, if you're something like MakerDAO or you're something like Ethereum or you're something like Solana and a, a venture fund is able to actually get a decent ROI on that uh, return on, on investment, uh, they are the pressure point that can get poked. And and you have to ask yourself when we talk about ICOs, why were they why were there no real NIM ICOs? Like like Bitcoin was a like hacked together project run by a NIM who we have no idea who he is, right? Why why don't we see Web3 projects done the same way? And that's because they can't raise a shit ton of fucking money from American venture funds. And those American venture funds are the fucking vulnerability mm -hmm. because they will get pressured and they will censor things, right? The whole value prop is at risk because of that centralization risk. And the venture funds will never fucking admit this. They will never say it out loud. Because if they say it out loud, it could be used against them. So instead, they deny that that it exists. They lobby the government for favorable result. And if something happens where they get pressured, they'll just be like, well, no one could have seen it coming. Right? That is their business model. And their incentives are set up in a way that they will just lie through their teeth till the day they die. Like that is what is going to happen. That is what has been happening. Um, it is extremely frustrating. Uh, and the real movement is one of free open source software that is not controlled by any single entity, uh, that is replicable, that people can share that code around the world. They can self-host it. They don't have to rely on you. Um, a lot of it is using Bitcoin as a monetization level. Supported by advertising. Sometimes. That's up to them. <laughs> Right. But that's Talk the point, you. right? It's up to yeah. them. Um, it's up to the user. Uh, and there is almost, it's not even a fundamental misunderstanding because the real fucking scam of it all, and I don't like saying the word scam like because I think it dilutes the power of the word. Mm -hmm. And I don't call everything a scam. The real, 
like the shame of the whole thing is they know better. Like, they know better. Like, the guys that are making fucking 400, 500K a year at A16Z, like, they know exactly what they're doing. But they will never say that out loud because that hurts their interests. And I have to applaud Jack Dorsey for um, going at them hard Mm -hmm. about that. Um, And I respect that he had to wait till he left Twitter to, to do that. Mm-hmm. They have control over Twitter, uh, but uh, it's a shame to see. It's going to continue for a long fucking time. Well, at least he's getting memed the fuck with it. I mean, Elon called him out. Jack's calling him out. Like, yeah, fucking Keanu Reeves is calling people out. Like, at least there's people out there going, "This is just fucking bullshit." Shut the fuck up. I wish Chris Dixon would come out. Like, I've offered him up. I said, "Come on the show. Let's talk about it. Explain Web three to people." You know, I think he should do a debate, but he's not going to do it. There's like no incentive for it. My favorite is when they block us. Like I have, I have Web three shills. I have A sixteen Z people that have me blocked. I've never interacted with them in my life. They just preemptively block me. I must be blocked. Like my well. block lists are empty. No one's blocked. I have nobody blocked. Yeah, I still don't get that. One. Yeah, well, that's fine. But if you're going to talk about the uncensorable web, Web three. The web where you can't, no one can stop, but you're like deleting tweets and you're blocking people and shit. Like the hypocrisy is so fucking obvious. It's yeah. I don't. It depends. It depends what you're the reason you're blocking for. If you're blocking, if like Chris Dixon or Mark Andreessen are blocking people who are challenging their narrative. Pete, fair. I have people like, blocking me that I've never. I didn't even know no, no. they existed. Listen to my point until Matt. I One, see the response where I can't see the response and I like look them up in, in, in you know in private browsing mode. Matt, and listen, I'm listen. like, who the fuck is this person? If you don't listen to me, I'm going to tell you again how I don't understand X pubs. Listen, okay. uh, so I think this, I, th- I think it's how, why you're blocking people. If if you're preemptively blocking Matt O'Dell because he's criticizing Web three, or you're Mark Andreessen and you're criticizing, criticizing, uh, sorry, you're blocking people because they criticize A sixteen Z, that is hypocritical. If so, like I block anyone in my timeline who promotes hex.com because I just don't want that bullshit in my timeline. That's the same reason I won't let morons in my house. Like it's a different reason. And your block list is zero, commendable. I fucking block people who promote hex.com, people who show Cardano, any of that bullshit is gone. Anyone who's abusive is gone. And they're different reasons. I don't see it as the same. I don't I don't want that shit in my timeline. Like I don't want to be at I don't think it's censorship to be sat at dinner and someone sits down at your table and starts abusing you or giving you shit. I think that getting rid of that person at a dinner table is the same as blocking someone on your timeline. I've got Look, no shame. I, I defend your right to block whoever the fuck you want to block. Yeah. But it's important to me that every single time one of these insecure motherfuckers decides to block me, they can know that I have a zero block list, that there's no shades of gray, my block list is empty. My mute list is empty. I see everything except when you block me because you're a weak motherfucker. Shades of Grey is this amazing song by this band called Biohazard who are from Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> it's a fucking great song. I'll I was check it uh, out. I was playing my daughter. Biohazard was like the first band I lost my shit for. I was playing my daughter the other day, Punishment of Shades of Grey. They'll, they'll be like... 0.01% of people listen to this who right now are going to be nodding going, yeah, biohazard. They get it. Let's fucking go. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, look, listen, I'd love Chris Dixon to talk. I've offered it up. He, like, replied to a tweet. He said he would. I think he should do it. He's not going to do it. There's only downside for him to do it. So, like, I'm just going to fucking call him out until he blocks me. I'm, I can't believe he hasn't blocked me yet, but I'm expecting it's coming. But whatever, Chris Dixon. Fuck you and your Web3 bullshit. Uh, oh, man. I don't know where we're up to next. I'm starting to get a bit drunk. What do you want to talk about? I don't know. Can I tell you about my football club? Yeah, let's talk about the football club. I've got to talk to you about this. This has been a, like a childhood dream, dude, to own a football club. And I think I've got something here. I was talking to Pump about this earlier. There's like two things that are really important in my life. Bitcoin's one and Bedford's the other, right? There's other shit, but like... I think I can leverage Bitcoin for the benefit of Bedford, and I think I can leverage Bedford for the benefit of Bitcoin. I think it's like symbiotic. And what I mean by that is 
I love where I live because I love the people. I'm very proud of it. But it is a small town. It's not a New York. It's not. What is a the London. population of Bedford? 174,000 people. Oh, but it's, it's big. Uh, yeah, but like, it's an area that like has. It's like a quote unquote city. No, no, no. It's not a city. It's a town. Yeah, it's a city. It's a town. But like, it's an era of deprivation. In America, right? we call those cities. I mean, it's, it's bullshit. As someone from New York City, that's bullshit. But it's mm. a, it's a city. It's, we definitely, it's definitely not a city here. But like, it's an area. Well, of the population of Boston is like four hundred k. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not gonna buy that. Hold on, what the fuck? Google it. Population of Boston. Boston. I know because I always give them shit. Six hundred eighty-four thousand. Huh. It's like There's rounded like, up four hundred k. Like three, three and a half times the size of Bedford, <laughs> but like, but like it's an era of deprivation, right? And like it's got, it hasn't got a lot going for it. We used to have some big companies here: Texas Instruments, Granada, like London Brick. It's all gone. There's no known thing here, and it just doesn't have a lot going for it. And I'm, I was always like. I want to do something. We've never had a league football team, right? We've never... And what league football means is there's like four professional divisions. Right. The Premier League, the Championship, League One, League Two. And I was like... I always said to my dad as a kid, like, I want to do this. But I never knew how I could. And I was like, I can now leverage the Bitcoin community. I've got one thing that no other local football team... Every local football team, their catchment area is the few miles around where they live. How many people can they get to the ground to pay five, ten pounds to go in? sell them a shirt and sell them a burger. And that's what they survive on. I've got this thing what they don't have is that like, I've got this group of whatever, 100, 150 a million people. global community. Global community people out Bitcoin who will get the fuck behind you. They got who the have fuck. money. They have money. Ideologically but, minded. Yeah. Who want this to work because they want to go, this is another win for Bitcoin. A bit like prior to the Bitcoin announcement, nobody knew who Michael Saylor was. Not many people knew who MicroStrategy was. No one knew who fucking fucking no one who, Bukele was. No right? one knew who Bukele was. You, El Salvador. Most, most most people, people barely knew it was a country. They didn't. They can point to it on a map. They probably point to like fucking Brazil or something. They still can't point to it on a map. Bedford is the MicroStrategy El Salvador sports. Like we're the hack. So I can leverage that. I can leverage that community to commercially bring success to the team, which is good for Bedford. But it works the other way around. I can leverage Bedford for Bitcoiners in that if this works, I get this right, and we won't know for four years. We might get promoted next year. It's not going to make a difference. When it makes a difference... Wait, so you like, get promoted next, do you go to League 2? Or do you go no, to no, like no, no, League no, no, dude, 6? Dude, we're, we're in the 10th division. Like <laughs> we're, we're six promotions from the, the professional league. So right? even if you win every season, you're still like two decades away from the Premier League. Well, it depends. If we do it consecutively, we're, one, we're nine, nine years. Okay. So best case summer. scenario, it's nine best years. Best case. Yeah, league. but by the way, if we if we did that, <laughs> if we did, like I'm saying it because it's really pissing people off in football because they're like, you're a fucking idiot. That's not possible. But, but they don't, <laughs> one, one thing is like, I'm having fun. But two, they don't understand Bitcoin. They don't understand Bitcoin. That's right. But I love the Ted Lasso news, by the way. Did Believe. That, he's, he's made it. He's made football cool for Americans. But no, we already liked football. We just called it soccer. So anyway, if I do this, if I leverage, <laughs> I can leverage Bedford for Bitcoiners because if this works, this is going to teach a lot of people who like football about Bitcoin as well, right? In four years' time, when our treasury does a 10x and suddenly we've got all this fucking capital that nobody else has, they can be like, huh, what happened there? I'll be like, what I fucking told you would happen <laughs> when you were laughing in my face, calling me an idiot and a moron. So, and also Bedford's like the perfect... The perfect place and the perfect team. It's a shit, you know, town which no one gives a fuck about in the middle of England. Like MicroStrategy, well, MicroStrategy wasn't a shit company, but it's a company no one gave a fuck about. Yeah. And and El Salvador, a country no one gave a fuck about. Like we're perfect for this. And and on the back of that, I get to see people all around the world care about my little town called Bedford. For me, Matt, honestly, I cannot tell you how happy I am. Like, like I need. No, I don't, do I say this? Yeah, I I kind of like nearly cried when it happened. Like it's been a, what, 26, 29 years ago, I first told my dad I was going to buy Bedford. I was 14. That's awesome. And like to actually think and actually do it. And today I was there and I went to watch them. Is he still maybe, alive? My dad. Yeah, my dad's still alive. Yeah, he's That's so fucking awesome. proud. So what, like, is, what is what is his opinion? 
Well, he just doesn't understand the life I lead. Is he still confused? Is he like, what the fuck's going on here? Yeah, everything's confusing to him because he doesn't understand what's going on in my life. But whatever. Like the point being is, I think this is a great thing for Bitcoin. That's awesome. This like works. This is great for Bitcoin because we get to Trojan horse Bitcoin into all the people around the world who like football to make them understand. And not everyone will like it. You'll get those fuckers who hate it because it's like, how did you do this? It's not my club. But yeah, anyway, it's a big deal for me, man. I'm going to tweet a lot about football now. I'm going to lose some followers. Dude, cheers to you, man. I'm uh, I'm a full, um, what are we calling it? Is it Real Bedford or Bedford FC? Real Bedford. They're, they're called Real Bedford FC. We can't, you can't change the name of a team mid-season. So, so it's formerly the, Bedford FC, but now it's Real Bedford, right? It, it'd be Real Bedford. At the end of the season, we will rebrand as Real Bedford, Skull and Crossbones. Why Bedford Skull and Galactic. Crossbones? Can we talk about that? Yeah, I mean, skulls are cool. <laughs> but that's new, right? That's that's I, a rebrand. Yeah. I got a skull here on my hand, man. Let's see that. Uh, no, it just... But it kind like, of puts Bitcoiners in like a death light a little bit. Not right? really. No, because like Bitcoin is... Just a little bit. No, Bitcoin is used like the skull and crossbones for like toxicity, right? Isn't it? Uh, let me check. Doesn't MVK use it? Like, can we just have like rainbows and? No, fuck that shit. Stuff. We're not Ethereum. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like. I'm. I'm just fucking with you. I like the skull and crossbones. I like real as the choice of the prefix. I mean, it was like, like skull and crossbones. There's like four what, you can choose from. Yeah, what would it look? What would look cool on the t-shirt or a hat? Like Skull and Crossbones, like it looks cool on the Raiders, looks cool on the Orlando Pirates, looks cool on some Paulie. Any team who does it, it looks cool. And, you know, Bitcoin is our Pirates. We're rebels. We're like, fuck you. So, yeah, I'm happy with that. Do that shit. Anyway, that was my little bit. I wanted to get into my show. No, I mean, I'm pretty excited. I'm I'm very excited for you. I, uh, I, it's my... One of my favorite, one of my favorite football teams now. So. What, 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 football what do you mean? One of your favorite? Fuck off! It's your favorite. <laughs> so when are we going to get you to Bedford? I'm, that, I thought that's where you were going with it, like that it's going to be like a Bitcoin Beach style. Yeah, it's going to be gonna, a pilgrimage. We're going to all fly to Bedford. Yeah, we're going to learn the language. <laughs> we're going to fly to Bedford, and then we can just like pay with Bitcoin. At yeah. like all the gas station, I guess you call them petrol stations over there, and and like the grocery stores and the pubs. Yeah, go to just, millenn- Millennium Kebabs. Get yourself. You got to get them donut. all to accept Bitcoin. Yeah, that's going to be a challenge. That's going to be a challenge. That's the play. Yeah. Well, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see if I can get a meeting with the government. I've been reaching out to somebody in that. I'm going to try and make that happen, dude. We haven't had an argument. Usually, like, you're shouting at me for x pubs. Last sponsors. year was, like, a bad year, man. You know, it's... Uh... Dude, you shout at me every year. You've not shouted at me. You've been doing, you've been doing good. <laughs> I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you, bro. <laughs> All right, when am I going to see you next? It's, it's midnight. You've been, I gotta... you've, been doing it, you've been doing it right. You've been doing gotta... it right. You've been doing good. I'm proud of you. I gotta catch a flight tomorrow. I can't say where because I don't want to dox myself. But like, and it's ten past midnight here. Should we call it? Okay, we can call it. You? Do we have Oops. predictions for next year, man? Tell me what you think is gonna happen. Oh, I have no predictions. I don't do predictions anymore after two hundred k by conference day. We're gonna get over hundred k next year, and Rail Bedford are gonna get their first promotion. Um, yes, Real Bedford is definitely going to get their first promotion because that's obvious. Like, it's very Duh. easy to go from Division 10 to Division 9. Yeah, with a good chairman. It's a very low bar. Um, do you think a spot ETF in, in America will happen next year? Do I think a spot ETF? Um, yeah. Um, well, I've had it on good information, like, it's coming. I just fucking Gary Gensler. Ugh, yeah, it's not going to happen this year. No, I think next year it'll happen. I think, no, I mean, uh, like, the year to come, it's not going to happen. You don't think we'll get a spot ETF next year? Nah. Yeah, I, I think we will, but again... They hate us. Do, but when I think about it, do I care? No, I don't care, but also it's not going to happen. I mean, I care if I want my bags to go up, but, like, what does a spot ETF actually mean? It just means boomers can buy Bitcoin. Right. I mean, they can already buy Bitcoin. They just have to go through a couple extra hoops. That's all. But they're not going to do it. I, I don't. I, I care for my bags on the spot, but like, I don't care that much. 
Okay. Uh, do you think we hit 100K over yes. the next year? Yes. I yeah, think I mean, we definitely un- hit. Undeniably, yes, right? Yeah. 100k next year. Do you think we hit 200k? No, no, I don't. I don't want to. Do you think we hit 200k by next halving? I think we can hit 200k shortly after the next halving. Okay, so not by the halving. You don't think we hit 200k by the halving? I don't want any blow off the tops. Like, there's going to be a blow off tops. Do you think we're going to have a 60% plus drawdown at any point over the next year? Nope. We might. I think 60% are done. I think, I think the leverage people like using like BlockFi and using Unchain and using Ledin and using all these different loan platforms, like they're leveraged. So there's going to be cascading uh, margin calls. Yeah, man. Uh, I, I don't know uh, where we are. It's a good rip. We did all right, didn't we? I enjoy this. We can just carry it on. Next time I see you in person, we'll just do a rip in person. Yeah, so I'm going to be there. I can give you the date. You're going to be in my hood? I'm going to be in your hood, and I know the exact date. What can date? I say it? Is that an optic problem? I think you can say the date as long as you don't say where my hood is. March 1st. Okay, I'll be here. Let's fucking rip it. Yeah. So do you know why? Do you know what happened? I've got to go to Texas, and I went to book a flight. You can't book direct flights from the UK to... Uh, Austin yet right so I went to book it and the connecting flight I found I've been using this website snap travel and the connecting flight was your hood that's where you can go I was like huh I was like fuck it I'll get I'll just I'll get the connection the next day I'll come in and we'll have a night with Matt Odell we might not record shit but we'll just hang out whatever well I'm definitely down to chill but we should just rip let's just rip it We'll, we'll, we'll have a good time well my problem is I won't have my I won't have my crew with me so I have a studio that's not with, this with video with video, yeah. Maybe we'll do it. Otherwise, I mean, I might. Be I have there like a fully night. set up studio. You don't have to bring anything. Listen, I, I would. Ra- do you know what I'd rather do? I'd rather just go out and have a night out with you. Fuck, hey, I'm I, I, show. I, I would dinner, prefer that as well. Fuck the drinks, audience. And I'll be in. I'll be in Texas for the whole month. I'll fly <laughs> you in. Come, 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 make a show with me. We'll do one with Marty. Okay, I'm down. I'm down for that as well. But I would. Lo- I would. I. Like I said, I mean, when you're in the hood, you can just stay here that night. Yeah, I mean, cool. I appreciate that. That's very like funny. literally the room is right behind here. I got a king bed. I can see the very dogs. Nice. Yeah, I have dogs. They're great dogs. They're big corners. I like your dogs. Well, listen, dude. I love you. You're one of my favorite people in the whole world. Uh, happy Christmas. Merry Christmas. Uh, happy New Year, and I will see you. Cheers. Uh, I will see you. Uh, yeah, man. I will see you on the other side, brother. Let's cheers. Cheers. Drink up. Drink up. Much love. Peace out, brother. Till next time.